mangrove to a metropolis has been the man-made story of Singapore. Our farmers and fishermen are an essential element in our economy, supplying fresh greens the whole year round. This video was made over 50 years ago. It opened my eyes to how important farming used to be back then. Today, we wouldn't survive long eating food only grown in Singapore. Which is why, for food's sake, I need to go far from the comforts of home. Sorry, sorry! <laughs> Just to find the real story behind the question. So why is our food more expensive? Ow, ow. In this episode, I sweat like a pig to root out the reasons behind why our pork is getting more expensive. Okay, okay, okay. Got muscles, no? Have a summer. It's quite heavy, like. I want to try. <laughs> And I head to Thailand to track down a menace that's threatening our food supply in unexpected ways. Enjoy it more because the prices might go up. Oh man. I'm being invited to the home of an award-winning calligrapher. Yong Cheong Tai has a profound understanding of Chinese culture. And today, he's promised to teach me about my culinary heritage with just a few brush strokes. Hello, Mr. Yong. Hello, hello. Mr. Ming. Hello, hello. Hi. We have a very long life and a very long time. From the beginning of the Chinese culture, to the present day, we, as a Chinese culture, especially as a Chinese culture,都喜歡吃豬肉,我們的文字也是變成跟它有關係。真的嗎?我我看不出。你看,家現在的文字是這樣寫的。其實這個字就是代表豬的意思。在古代的時候呢,它是這個是物質。也是蓋頭來的。
We import pork from over 20 countries across the world. The bulk of our fresh chilled pork comes from Indonesia, Australia and East Malaysia, specifically Sarawak. Then, there's frozen pork and other pork products from Brazil, the Netherlands, the US, Spain and more. So I want to know if we've been affected by this crisis yet. And what better way to start my unscientific research than here in the wet market? There's this disease called African swine fever that has affected the livestock. Have you heard of it and does it affect your prices? No, not affected. I didn't notice it. Never increased. Only Chinese New Year time. Huh? No, all the same. All the, all same. the same price. Good, nice. According to the Singapore Food Agency, this outbreak has minimal impact to the overall supply of pork to Singapore. So pork prices have been stable in recent months despite the swine fever outbreak. But a different picture emerges when we look at the trend of prices of chilled pork over the last 10 years. Average retail prices of lean pork have increased by 11%. Pork ribs, 15%. And pork belly, more than 20%. So what's driving our pork prices up? So I'm here in Sarawak and I'm here to visit a pig farm that exports pork to Singapore. And the thing is, I need to be quarantined for a couple of days before I can visit the farm. I, yeah. I thought this was a farm. This doesn't look like a farm. This oh no, like... this is not a farm yet. You are at the border of the farm and the biosecurity. This looks like a huge compound. So actually, this is this divide clean and dirty people. So you are outside, you are dirty. I'm dirty. You are dirty at the moment. I need to get clean. I'm squeaky clean and I'm going to meet my piggy friends now. Dr. Ng, a veterinarian by training, has been a pig farmer for more than two decades. He rears about 65,000 pigs here. Every week, 1,300 of them make the one-way journey to our shores. Professor right, so Dr. Ng, where are we right now? Oh yeah, you, in, you are in one of the poker pen, actually where all these pigs are intended to be exported to Singapore. Well, all these are various type of breeds here. And then, uh, you, as you can see, they are very muscular. Muscular in the sense you can see the muscles, you know, very broad, full of muscles on the body. That means they, they contain a lot of lean meats. That is what the Singaporean like. I've arrived just in time for lunch. Come, feeding. Oh, you want to try? Yeah, you can go sure. inside. Yeah. Can I? Yeah, yeah, you go in. Yeah. Sorry, piggies. Ah, make sure, make sure they like you, eh? <laughs> Okay, come. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay, yeah, you can try this. Yeah. So just scoop in. Uh. Yeah. They're so eager, they're all over us. They're oh, biting you. my shoes, my oh, pants. You are a stranger to them. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, come. Yeah, come, yeah, come. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna feed you. Stop biting my pants. <laughs> <laughs> now, prices of pork in Singapore have increased in the yes. last 10 years. Yeah. Right? Quite significantly. What is causing that? Now, actually, you look at the raw material. Corn, wheat, fish meal, especially fish meal, the protein source, the prices have increased quite significantly over the years you know, because uh, fish are getting less. Obviously, fish meal prices will go up. And then uh, we still give quite a bit of fish meal to our, uh, our pigs. How much have feed prices increased? I think over the last 10 years, probably they have been increased by another 40%, 50%. Bad weather or drought will affect the price badly, which is actually happening all the time. So prices of grain, Fish meal and vitamins, all crucial ingredients in pig feed, have gone up over the years. That's a huge deal, especially since one pig can consume almost three times its body weight in food before it's ready for the market. So you've got about 65,000 pigs in this farm. So that means if feed prices have increased by 50%, that's a significant cost, yeah? So no choice, we have to increase the prices of pork. So feed is a major factor but not the only one. Today, Dr. Ng and his team are sending these 600 pigs to Singapore. They've reached five months of age and they're ready to head for our shores. It's a 48-hour journey that requires extreme care. 
pigs are uh, actually the longer on the rod, the more stress they'll have. So, and worse still is uh, they don't have a sweat gland. Like pigs, they need a cool temperature, not more than 28 degrees, constant airflow, uh, enough space, air space for them to rest, then they are okay. Yeah, that, that is important part of uh, transportation. Transportation costs make up around 10% of the selling price of each of these pigs. Now, uh, oil prices, so the last few years, I think it's not a very good, so our costs have to go up. So you see, look at this, uh, building a ship, all the iron ore, prices also increases, metal increases, so everything adds up, so no choice, everything has to go. So our transportation also basically have to go up also. Now, I just spent the entire day on the farm, and I learned about the complexities of rearing these animals. In terms of cost, you have feed prices that have gone up by 50% in the last 10 years. Safe and efficient transport costs have also increased because it's getting more and more expensive to rear and to move these animals to Singapore. Does increasing costs in the farms translate to an increase in pork prices I see in the supermarkets? Probably no one has the scoop on pork prices in Singapore, like Ting of OJJ Foods. The company is responsible for almost a third of chilled pork imports entering Singapore. Okay, Ming, this is the pork sides which they collect from the slaughterhouse. So they will push it into the storage, zero to four degrees, so that it's always in good condition. And after that, they'll put it out for deboning. Can I try it? Yes, I can try, but uh, got muscles not. Have uh, some. Uh. It's quite heavy there. Like. I want to try. I'm going to try and drag it down myself, okay? <laughs> okay, not as heavy as I expected, but it's a lot more unwieldy than you expect to deal with a swinging carcass uh, that is completely dead weight. It takes more than 300 employees to get all this pork to our tables. Labour costs, how do they add up to the price of pork eventually? Labour forms a big component. Being labour intensive, we have to then look at how to automate as much of the functions as possible. Because we have to still offer our customers very affordable pricing. So we work very hard on containing the cost. We cannot say just increase price. But of course, if the raw material price increase a lot, then we, we got no choice but to increase price. Because raw material forms high end of 70 over percent of our selling price. So not a lot of buffer. So if the, the raw material prices were to increase significantly, 10%, 15%, we will have to pass on to the consumer. Yeah. But while the prices of chilled pork have gone up, I learned earlier not all cuts are increasing at the same rate. Despite our efforts to get lean, surprisingly it is the fattiest cut, pork belly, that has shot up in prices the most. What's going on? So it seems like everyone's trying to get lean and eat lean too. You'd think that fattier cuts of pork, like pork belly, are getting more and more unwanted and hence cheaper. But chilled pork belly prices have shot up 20% in 10 years, far more than other cuts. What's going on here? So I'm here in the CBD and it's lunch hour. I hear there's just one restaurant nearby that serves pork belly and they get absolutely rammed and packed during lunchtime. This restaurant, Mr. Wu, serves up a variety of la mian and rice bowls during lunch. Restaurant owner Brendan has been in the F&B business for almost a decade and he's obsessed with pork belly. I like to eat pork belly so much that actually my Instagram handle is called Mr. Pork Belly. It's not only the best-selling pork dish in our menu, it's actually the best-selling dish in our menu. Best-selling dish? Why don't you join us for lunch service and see for yourself? Inside the kitchen? Yeah. Okay, steady, fine. Ah, okay, let's go. 
So Jiaxun will show us a plate of the pork belly, how it looks supposed to look like during live service. Then maybe you can try doing one plate later. Sure, no problem. Okay, come. Yeah, so usually about five thick slices. And they'll drizzle some of the sauce over. Lam sam zap on top. Today, I'm in charge of plating pork belly. One more. And my first order arrives within minutes. One pork belly rice. Bye, pork belly rice. Bye, pork belly lamb. So, in about 20 minutes already, I've had close to 16, 17 orders. This is almost one a minute, the orders coming in. Uh, I need to prep these and get them out onto the trays, cut them nicely. Uh, this really seems to be a very popular dish. And if you look at it, this glistening, shiny piece of pork, I find it quite easy to imagine why people want to order this. Uh. So many lunch tickets. All of them. Ooh, really? Not kidding, huh? Pork belly, pork belly. There's literally pork belly in every single ticket. Is this normal? Or does this happen every day? It's normal. Every day almost. I think increasingly in the last few years. Even restaurants, both um, Western restaurants and other cuisines are coming up to this piece of meat nowadays. And in fact, people are also realising that pork is actually not that unhealthy. In fact, pork fat has been listed as one of the top 10 most nutritious food. And people are figuring out, hey, if I'm going to spend my guilt uh, quota on butter, why not use it on pork fat instead? In 2015, a team of scientists analysed more than a thousand raw foods and ranked them according to how nutritious they are. And the results went viral. Because one particular item surprised everyone. Pork fat. It was ranked the 8th most nutritious item. And pork fat is what makes the belly so undeniably delicious. Roast it, grill it, braise it, fry it. It's a versatile cut that oozes flavour. So it's no wonder it's the star of so many dishes. The impact of our renewed love for pork belly is certainly felt here at Huber's Butchery, Singapore's largest butcher shop. Hi, Andre. Hey, hey, Ming. Hey, hey how nice are you? To meet you. I'm good they supply pork to almost a thousand F&B outlets, and they've seen what growing demand can do to our pork belly prices. Let me bring you upstairs, and I'll show you exactly why this is so. You can see the different proportions of, of the meat. You know, the leg is about 25%, shoulder is about 15 to 20, you know, the collar 10, and then the loin is around 25%. And then the pork belly only represents about 13 to 14%. Uh, so the demand has increased, the pork belly prices has, has increased. And uh, what, what this happens is that, of course, you can't just keep selling pork belly. Right, uh, you have to basically sell all the cuts in the carcass. You can't just keep slaughtering more pigs just for the belly. Then, of course, naturally, that cut has to increase to control the demand because there's only to... a limited supply. Andre, do you think there's going to continue to be an increase in demand for pork belly in future? And with that, the increase in price too? Yes, uh, definitely for the foreseeable future, I still see an uh, increase because it's not really just the Singaporean demand. It is really the worldwide demand as well. So traditionally, Asia used to consume a lot of the pork belly, but now even like the Europeans, uh, the Americans and all these are also now starting to consume a lot. So if demand from the worldwide is increasing of, of this particular cut, then yes, I, I see the price really starting to go up more and more. So prices won't be going down anytime soon. If I don't want to fork out that money, are there cheaper alternatives? So in a supermarket, you typically find two types of pork. 
Now your frozen pork comes up to just over ten dollars per kilogram, and chilled pork comes in at a price of about fifteen dollars per kilogram. That means you're paying almost fifty percent more for your fresh chilled pork. So which are shoppers buying? I would get fresh if it's frozen. It's literally bland. It's, it's, it's really no taste. My obvious preference would be chilled. Chilled is just firmer, it just feels fresher. Frozen just doesn't feel quite right to me. The chilled one usually has a better texture. I feel that frozen pork uh, has been kept there for a longer while. So I'm not very sure, you know, I, I think the freshness is more assured when it's just chilled pork. So it's got a shorter shelf life. So as a chef, I'm no stranger to using frozen pork. Some of the best quality pork in the world comes to Singapore frozen and chefs use it and it's of great quality. But here in the supermarket, for some reason, there's this perception that fresh chilled pork that's never been frozen is of uh, better texture, better flavour and higher quality. Is there even any truth to the perception that frozen pork is worse in texture and taste? Prof Chen, a food scientist, has helped me design a simple test. Hi Prof Chen. Hi, He's prepared two samples of roasted pork. One made from fresh pork and the other frozen. Both are from the same country and source. Okay, so this is a, a texture analyzer which allows us to analyze the texture of any food product including meat. So now we have a sample of fresh pork. The probe measures the amount of force it takes to pierce through the sample. The easier it is, the softer the texture. And the results surprised even a chef like myself. So uh, the texture analysis tells us that the frozen pork can even be more tender than the fresh pork. What about in terms of nutritional value, say? Well, I would say uh, actually the fast freezing of the pork preserves nutrition better. Because if you put the fresh pork through the storage and transportation, uh, it actually tend to be exposed to, uh, to the air. So the oxidation may occur and also the bacterial contamination may take place. Whereas frozen pork, when we immediately freeze it, all the nutrient value will be preserved. So it's safer in a sense. And uh, it's cheaper than fresh pork. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, going to tell my wife to buy more frozen pork in the future. I'm generally surprised. Okay. Yeah. The results suggest that frozen pork is more tender than fresh pork. But is there a difference when it comes to taste? I have two pieces of pork belly here. A fresh piece of pork belly as well as a frozen piece of pork belly. I'm marinating both pieces of pork belly with the same spices and roasting them for the same amount of time. And then I'm going to do a taste test. Right, we've got two plates of pork here. Plate two is using frozen All pork right. belly. Plate one is fresh chilled All pork right. belly. Both are cooked the exact same way. We're going to walk around now and let people try this to see whether or not they can discern if there's a taste and texture difference. Right, ladies, I've got two plates of pork belly here. Would you like to try this and see whether you can find if there's a difference? So number two is actually much juicier. It, uh, you can taste the fat and it's quite crispy in the skin. I, I prefer plate two. Why do you prefer plate two? Oh, actually it tastes softer and like much more juicier. Two is better. I don't really taste different. Don't really taste different. Mm. What an interesting result. On the plate, there was almost no discernible difference. Some people even prefer the flavour and texture of the frozen pork. This goes to show that you can enjoy your favourite dishes with your favourite cuts, in this case pork belly, for less. Over the last four weeks, I've travelled far and wide to find out what's pushing up food prices. Hi everyone. The reasons vary for different foods. This batter, we really want to win money with this. We must 
sell it to a totally crazy price. The seafood market now is controlled by the Chinese. So if there's no money, they don't want to buy it. Right. Our exacting supermarket standards played an unexpected role. These goods can't be sold in Singapore. This is not beautiful. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Even climate change has begun to make its impact felt. The temperature gets above 30 degrees, the tubers stop growing. But there is yet another menace on the horizon that could have a devastating impact on our food. It hasn't really hit our food prices yet, but it's already scaring farmers the world over. Our food supply is facing a terrible menace. Its impact is likely to be devastating and widespread. It's this. A worm no longer than two centimeters. This is the fall army worm. And its choice of food, corn. You might be thinking, corn? What's the big deal? At most, we don't get popcorn on movie nights, right? Well, think again. Corn is found in so many things. It's in the things that we drink, as well as the things we use, like the batteries in this remote. And it's also found in the things that we consume. Like cereal, sweetened yogurt, salad dressings, peanut butter, even paracetamol. It is also in things we don't eat, like toothpaste, soap, and shampoo. And I'm finding out that corn is one of the world's top animal feeds fed to almost every animal we eat, including chickens. Chicken is our favourite meat. The average Singaporean consumes more than 30 kilograms of chicken every year. Hello. Hi, can I have a half chicken? Okay. How much impact will the fall army worm have on food prices in Singapore? Surely, if corn is affected, farmers can feed chickens other grains, can't they? It's time to check in with my old friend, Dr. Gosh. Prof Gosh! Oh wow, look at that. That really looks good. Dr. Gosh has been involved in measuring consumer price expectations in Singapore. So Prof Gosh, how is this fall army worm situation going to affect us as Singaporeans? Now many of the countries in the region are affected by that. So that is immediately causing a supply disruption in corn. So that might increase the price because the supply is going to be lower. Now, take for example, the one that we are enjoying now, chicken rice. Chicken, chicken rice. rice? Yes, chicken rice has chicken in it, right? So because corn and maize forms one of the biggest elements of fodder which goes to animal feed, obviously the cost of production of chicken goes up. And this plate of chicken rice is going to become more expensive. Enjoy it more. Are there substitutes for corn in this case? There might be some substitutes, but it might be at a higher cost. So the the best defense here is to try to prevent the pest from proliferating anymore. My conversation with Prof Gosh has prompted me to head up north to visit a chicken farm in Malaysia. I want to see for myself just how critical corn is to chicken production. Bing Tuck Farm supplies around 20,000 fresh chickens to Singapore every day. Operations manager Mr. C tells me that chicken feed makes up 70% of their cost. <laughs> hey, how about you? My friend. Okay, so this is Mr. C. Okay. 大约有差不多一点, 
点三啊，一点一点二。呃，大致上应该是差不多这样。差不多是的。所、嗯、以、so, 他们一生内呢，会吃多少饲料啊？呃，平均一只鸡呢，他们的饲料的那一个呃采食量是差不多三公斤以上。这个就是我们鸡只平时啊、呃、每一天所吃的这个饲料，有些什么东西、啊？呃，它里面最主要的成分是这个玉米，当中就占了大概五到六十八千。这个玉米是呃目前上市啊、呃、目前市场上最经济实惠也最容易取得的这一个原料，而且它也比较容易被我们的这个鸡只给消化。But how much longer can corn continue to be a financially viable animal feed? In just three years, the fall armyworm has devoured more than a billion dollars worth of crops in Africa. And now, like an invading army, the pest has been on a march and is moving fast. Just reading up on this pest terrifies me, because for me it's quite personal. I cook chicken, I sell chicken, and I really like eating chicken. I want to know how worried I need to be, and if anything is being done to control this crisis. The worm was first spotted in Asia in southern India in July 2018. Within a year, the fall army worm has been reported in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. Many parts of Southeast Asia, as well as China. I start my search for answers in neighboring Thailand. The fall army worm was first reported here in Thailand in December 2018. Since then, it has spread to more than 50 of the 77 provinces in all of Thailand. That's two thirds, two complete thirds of the country. Affected by this pest. Nakhon Ratchasima Province is one of Thailand's main corn belts, and I've arrived just in time for farmers' field day. Cut the yard, if there is a cut, the root will start to grow. The bark will be strong and will be stronger. Today's farmers' field day is all about teaching the farmers how to identify this pest. Behind the effort. Is Corteva AgriScience. Good morning, all, and thank you for coming. They have deployed hundreds of agricultural experts across Asia to combat the fall army worm. So this pest is not uh, native to Asia. So when it has arrived in Asia, so the farmers were caught unaware. They do not know what to do, and so there was a sort of uh, panic situation because the pest is uh, so damaging. It can eat all stages of the corn. If you see initially, you can see the damage caused by the early larvae. The early insects usually scrape the leaf surface, and once the larvae become big, they eat the chunks of leaves, and you can see the big damage. Oh wow! There we go. Yeah, here you can see. Oh, it's all the way inside. Yeah. At least it, three or four layers of peeling back before we found the worm inside, huh? Yeah, it goes deep inside the leaf wall and feeds from there, and that's one of the reason it's very difficult to control this insect pest. Hi guys, so what is up? Have all of your corn fields been affected by the fall army worm? Yes, yes, yes. I've never had a year. I've been doing this for a long time. I've never had a year. This is the first time. I've been doing this for a long 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 time. I don't know what to do now. The corn season has only just begun, but already all the farmers I spoke to have been affected by the fall army worm. One of the farmers, Dang, has volunteered to bring me to see the damage on his farm with my own eyes. His field typically gives him a yield of around 15,000 kilograms of corn. From a distance, I couldn't really see anything wrong, but as I got closer. ครับลักษณะการอาการที่หนอนจะกินครับมันจะเป็นลักษณะอย่างนี้ครับจะกินจากจากยอดตรงไปถึงโคนต้นนี่ครับคือลักษณะการกินจากนี
สังเกตความเสียหายที่เกิดขึ้นนะครับอยู่ประมาณ 90% นะครับ 90% 90% ครับ 90% 90% of its plants are infested with this little worm Dang tells me that for the first time in his 40 years as a farmer his 40 day old corn crops might not even survive till harvest It's difficult to see right but this entire crop has been devastated by this one new invasive pest, the fall army worm. Food for a chef is supposed to bring joy, you know, supposed to feed people, give sustenance. But the growing aspect of it, learning from the farmer, this is getting really upsetting. I'm quite, I'm quite bugged by this, no pun intended. All this devastation that you can see, you can't see the worm, but it's killing the entire crop. To know more about the habits of this terrifying enemy, I'm heading to the country's leading corn research institute. This is where they've been studying the fall army worm ever since its appearance in Thailand. Nice to meet you. What makes the fall army worm so much more different and devastating compared to other pests? Non, ก็ทุกข้าวโพดลายจุดเนี่ยค่ะสามารถเข้าทำลายข้าวโพดได้ทุกระยะการเจริญเติบโตของข้าวโพดหนอนที่มีขนาดใหญ่นี่นะคะก็จะทำลายได้มากกว่าและสามารถเข้าทำลายข้าวโพดได้ถึง 70% ของพื้นที่แปลงทั้งหมดค่ะ 70% that sounds like a lot of a corn crop to destroy how much can one f o r army worm consume เรายังไม่ทราบข้อมูลที่แน่ชัดค่ะ but we are determined to find out in the first pot We're placing one seven-day-old f o r a r m y worm on each of the three stalks of baby corn. In the second pot, one 16-day-old f o r a r m y worm each. So this is when the worms eat the most. Yes, it's when the worms eat the most. And for the last two pots, Sankai wants to simulate a severe infestation. Now we're going to put five larva per plant. So it's five seven-day-old larvae on each of the three stalks in the third pot, or 15 larvae altogether, and a similar number of 16-day-old larvae in the last pot. We're going to seal this box up now. And uh, what next? เดี๋ยวเราทิ้งไว้หนึ่งคืนนะคะพรุ่งนี้มาดูกันว่าที่เราปล่อยหนอนลงไปเนี่ยมันจะมีผลยังไงกับต้นข้าวโพดบ้าง All right. Good night, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. So it's been almost 24 hours since we placed the fall army worms on the corn plants, and we're here to find out just how large the appetites of these little worms are. So how are our plants doing? Oh wow! So much damage! Oh my goodness! Look at that. จะเห็นว่ามีความเสียหายที่เกิดจากหนอนเนี่ยปริมาณมากกว่าหนอนขนาดเล็กค่ะ It's basically cut the shoot right off at the root so this is the damage that just one worm can achieve in such a short span of time from last night it's it's incredible can you imagine how much damage a whole field of these late stage fall army worms can achieve that was bad, but pot four with five 16-day-old larvae on each of the three stalks was absolutely shocking. <laughs> Look at that! Wow, essentially the whole plant has been destroyed. So these fall army worms, they only eat corn? ไม่ค่ะสามารถกินข้าวโพดได้เป็นพืชอาหารที่ชอบมากที่สุด
แต่จะกินพืชอื่นๆได้อีกมากถึง80กว่าชนิดค่ะ Over 80 species that they can attack. So, the tiny four-armed worm has a huge appetite. This voracious eater can consume up to 80 plant species, including rice, cabbage, and even fruits. A scary thought, given how fast this pest has been spreading. The four-armed worm migrated here in December 2018. And in half a year, it's already spread to two-thirds of the country. The fall army worm larva. It's a wingless caterpillar and it's got seven pairs of legs. And it crawls. Just how on earth did something that crawls like this spread so quickly? I've arranged to meet Pampa again for more answers. He's the field scientist I met at the farmer's field day. Pampas asked me to meet him here. I'm in the middle of a bunch of cornfields. Uh, did I mention it's 5 a.m.? Good morning, Pampa. Morning. Tell me what we're looking for here. Yeah, you know this uh, fall army worm, it's a nocturnal pest. It usually likes to feed in the night. So, uh, if we come in the early in the morning, we can see different uh, stages. Since the pest is uh, very uh, gregarious, we can find overlapping generations in the field. Let me show you the signs in the field. Can you help me pull out a few plants so that we can look for uh, larvae? Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, you can see the. You can see. Oh, shoot. yeah. You can see the second instar larvae, and you can see the third instar larvae. Oh crap, there's another one in there. There's so many of them. Yeah, so you can see there are different stages from small from small to big. More fall army worms means more damage. And here it's common to find several generations of the fall army worm within a cornfield. That's because they reproduce faster in this region. In tropical regions where the humidity is high, where the temperature is high, they lay more number of uh, eggs and they multiply very fast. So the adults on an average can lay at around uh, 1600 eggs. So you can see the egg mass uh, here. Yep. So in each of the egg mass, sometimes there will be 100 to 200 eggs. So you can imagine how fast the fall army worm can spread. That means about 150, 160 eggs per day? Yeah, yeah. You might have noticed by now, the so-called fall army worm is really a caterpillar, a baby version of a moth. That is why they can fly and spread far and wide. Here you can see the adults hiding here. Can you see that? Oh goodness gracious me, yeah. Yeah, so the adults are very strong flyers and uh, they can fly to about uh, 400 kilometers in one crop season and they can fly about uh, 100 kilometers in a single night assisted by winds. 400 kilometers in one crop season and a hundred kilometers per night. Yeah. That's like a car. How, how does that happen? Yeah, th this is because uh, of the assistant by winds and that's why they are able to spread very, uh, very fast. So it sounds like there's no stopping the fall army worm. Is it here to stay? Yeah, the fall army worm is here to stay and cause a significant damage. They're productive, hungry and fast. How are we going to win the war against the worm? Typically, farmers spray like this, which is not the correct way to manage fall army worm. There is a specific way uh, to apply for fall army worm. So you have to be covering the side leaves and also you have to direct your spray nozzle towards the whorl of the plant. Mm. So let me demonstrate to you how to do application. Okay. So you just spray and then you spray around the stalk, then directly down the middle. It's quite time consuming. Yeah, it's uh, time consuming, but it is more effective because uh, you know the larvae are feeding inside. So it's very important that you direct the nozzle towards the whorl of the leaf. Other potential solutions tested by Corteva include applying a treatment to the corn seeds to protect the crop in its early stages. Other experts also recommend looking into natural enemies against the fall army worm, such as ants, a strain of virus, or even fungus. 
this fall army worm, we've been looking at it the last couple of days. It eats voraciously, it travels far distances, and it's a new pest. Corn is one of the most crucial cash crops in all of Asia, and it's crucial that they figure out how to deal with this devastating new pest. For now, global corn supply remains unaffected by the outbreak in Asia. That's because the US is the world's top corn producer. And after China imposed tariffs on US soybeans as part of the trade war, some soybean farmers switched to corn, flooding global markets with even more supply. Still, Asia is responsible for almost a third of the world's corn supply. The fall armyworm outbreak remains a fast-growing, ongoing epidemic. Will the outbreak eventually catch up with us and our food supply? There are actually solutions. But all these take time to implement. The question is going to come down to whether or not the farmers can get this education quickly enough and implement these solutions to halt the spread of this fall army work.